So hello and welcome, happy Friday. Today is Friday, April the 22nd, and this is Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers episode number 156, and today's Earth Day. So, happy Earth Day to everyone out there who lives on Earth. So, it's 56 degrees Fahrenheit outside, great break in the weather, sun shiny, that's 13 degrees Celsius, and uh, pollen coming into the hives, drones are present, and uh, swarm season is sneaking right up on us. Somebody asked me recently, what's the earliest you've had swarms in your neck of the woods? Which, by the way, is the northeastern United States, state of Pennsylvania, the Keystone State, and at end of April, according to my records. So we need to be ready right now for that. So if you're brand new, welcome. If you want to know what we're talking about today, please look down in the video description and you'll see the topics that we're going to cover. So it's going to be very interesting. Let's get rolling. Uh, the very first question comes from Tim and Vicky from Fergus, Ontario, Canada. Wondering if you could go over the purpose of checkerboarding frames. Is it to provide a nuke with drawn comb so it can build up quickly, but also to control the buildup by making the bees fill out empty frames? Thanks. Okay, so in fact this is timely because this time of year you're going to be inspecting hives on these nice hot days when's the best time of day to inspect your beehive generally mid-afternoon so 2 p.m 3 p.m sun's nice and high weather's warm most of your forages are out so you're dealing with fewer bees so you can see the frames better when you start to see that they are heavily populated it is time to start to spread things out and to super your hives so what does it mean to super a hive so if you went through winter and you had a deep uh, brood box, for example, maybe a medium on top of that, which by the way, for me, is the optimum setup for getting your bees through winter. And uh, they start to fill up right now. So when we see pollen and everything coming in, they're in rapid expansion mode, which means a thousand new bees per day or more because the queen is in full production now. So we need to spread things apart and you need to be careful about it, in my opinion, and that's because uh, we can still have very cold days. The weather can turn for the worse and we can get snow again, heaven forbid. And this is the reason why you keep records about weather, what the bees did when, and what you did to help them get through. How many swarms get out and got away from you before you had a chance? Uh, so one of the ways that we alleviate swarming and reduce the risk of swarming is to add more space in the hive. Now checkerboarding just means you're taking existing combs existing frames with brood, with the bees using it, brood, pollen, nectar resources, and things like that. This can also be up in your honey super where it's just honey, for example. If it's really filling up and it's all capped towards the middle, you know, they're a little bit reluctant to fill out the final frames, especially if you have a 10 frame box. So standard Langstroth hives have eight or 10 frames in each box. So if you had a 10 frame box, the number one and number 10 frames generally get filled out last. So we can accelerate their use of the frames up the central column because that's where most of the activity, most of the warmth from the bees exists and also where they're producing brood and everything else. So that's where they're building infrastructure first. So if we spread apart already developed and finished comb and frames and put in new frames in between, that's the area that they're going to work first before those outside frames. And in some of my hives, uh, when they finish out the final ends, number one or number 10 or number one or number eight, depending on what size box you have, uh, they do it on the eastern side if your hive has a south facing landing board. And if it's a north facing landing board, which would be rare, but if you have that, it's also going to be in the east. Wherever the morning sun warms the most, that's where they tend to get to work first inside the hive. So checkerboarding is just a matter of putting in new frames between uh, existing frames so they work them uh, instead of just adding them to the outside. But when it comes to brood, your deep brood box, uh, and they have full brood, some people, in order to thwart their stimulus to swarm, would spread apart brood frames in the middle of their full brood and stick a brand new frame of drawn comb in there or no drawn combs as a frame of foundation. And I personally am reluctant to do that. And that's because bee space is already there between those frames. And since these are the brood that they're working, open brood, eggs, capped pupa, things like that, uh, the bees warm the space 
they warm those cells because they still have to keep it between 94 and 97 degrees. So if we're at 55 or 60 degrees, they're still spending a lot of effort and resources warming that brood. So I add frames to the outside of the brood cluster area. So when you've got full frames of brood, I don't disrupt those. I don't split those apart and put a checkerboarded new frame right inside there. You can put a medium super above it, but then they tend to work up if they haven't expanded out to the full width, to the full number of frames that you already have in the deep box. So we wanna wait until they're about 80 to 90% through with those frames before we add more. But personally, I'm not a fan of checkerboarding in the brood itself. Checkerboarding honey supers, absolutely, no problem. Do it, it's fun, every other frame. It's also a way to use existing foundation and frames in the brood area so if you had your brood cluster, let's say it occupies five or six frames of brood and you have a 10 frame box, just outside of that, you can pull an existing frame and you can put in foundationless frames. And that's just a wooden frame with a starter strip maybe and no foundation, no guides at all other than that. And then you use one of the outside frames that's been drawn by the bees to sandwich it in between and that works as a guide and then the bees will draw out foundationless comb, which by the way, in the brood box, is my preferred place to have foundationless comb. Let the bees do their thing down there because for me, that's always brood. I also don't rotate boxes. So when springtime comes, if they're in this upper box, I wait for them to start to fill that and then they move down into the lower box on their own. And once that starts happening and I start to see that upper box, which in the winter time becomes a site for early brood rearing because that's the warm spot in there. Uh, as I start to move down, then they will start to fill that with honey and nectar, right? So as they start to fill that, and when that becomes 80% full, that's the time to super. But we want them to use the resources down below and naturally migrate down on their own. So I hope that answers that question. Question number one. Question number two, moving on, is from Shauna South, in South Dakota. It says, I have a hive I requeened in October. It's very late in the season, and it's a small colony, and I inspected it today, and they made it through winter, but there's only maybe one frame of bees. The queen is there and they have lots of honey and I gave them a pollen patty today. My question is, should I also feed them sugar water or is honey enough to help this colony? Okay, so once again, and I'll just refresh that, I only provide sugar syrup on colonies um, that are brand new or small or definitely not gonna be used later in the spring for pulling honey off, for example. So this one is an underdog colony. We need to know kind of why they're small. They could be facing other problems, varroa mites and things like that. But uh, given that they have honey already there, should you also put in sugar syrup on a hive like that? And I would feed sugar syrup on top, inside, so on a feeder shim. So would I do that if they sell a honey? Yes, I would, because one-to-one -one sugar syrup is ready for consumption for the bees. They invert it, they create invertase, it's still sucrose, but the water content of one-to-one -one sugar syrup, by weight, pound of uh, dry sugar, pound of water mixed together, and that is a ready-to-use carbohydrate resource. This time of year, there may not be a lot of condensation inside the hive, as there is in winter, so it's a little backwards. So in wintertime, they would have some condensation where the dew point is achieved inside the hive and the bees can actually get to that water and they use it to liquefy and utilize honey that's stored in the hive. So they still need water for all their metal, metabolic processes. So this is important. One-to-one -one sugar syrup, yes, even though they still have honey because they can't utilize just honey. They always need water too so that they can... Uh, process and use the honey. I hope that makes sense. And what is the worst case scenario for you? If they don't use the sugar syrup that you put on, then you wasted some sugar syrup. On the other hand, if they need it and you don't provide it and they can't really utilize the stored honey on its own, because now we're in transition, um, then you risk uh, reducing their ability to build in spring. So low on carbohydrates there. So it's a failing safe thing. Again, put the sugar syrup on, risk your $4 or whatever it costs for the sugar and the water to mix up and put it on there. So that's the uh, end of question two. On to question three. 
This comes from Marjorie Golding, Norfolk, Virginia. It's a little bit of Navy population down there in Norfolk. Little Creek area too. Shout out to those people. So it says here, a bald-faced hornet nest was found in a neighbor's overgrown crepe myrtle. It was removed last night by a professional, but I would be lying if I were to say I'm not scared. With my history of anaphylaxis, do you have any suggestions for what to look out for? Are there any predators of bald-faced hornets? Paper wasps, possibly? Okay, so here's the thing. Bald-faced hornets, by the way, hopefully you've never encountered them. I've had several encounters with bald-faced hornets, and they're really not hornets at all. They're just wasps. All hornets are wasps, not all wasps are hornets. So we only have one true hornet here, and that's the European hornet. But the bald-faced hornet is distinctive. It's black and white, and some people call it the white-faced hornet because it has a white spot right on the front of its head there. And uh, <clears throat> the thing is, when they're out and about, uh, collecting pest species of insects, for example. So they're, as a pest control animal, they're fantastic. Uh, we get into a pickle with them when they build into a hedge or something right near someone's entrance to their house, right along the driveway where people are walking. And the problem is you don't notice them. And that's because what's going on this time of year? They winter over in isolation, so they're not social in winter. So the queens that fly out, they mate in the fall, and so fertile queens go out and they winter over in humus, decomposing material, things like that. That's why sometimes you're rolling logs or raking leaves and you'll find a hornet down there. Uh, the bald-faced hornet is a wasp. And that's the queen. So what does the queen do in spring? She wakes from her winter a hiding place and she comes out and she starts to build a paper nest so it's made out of cellulose so you'll also see them wasps of a lot of different species chewing on unfinished wood you just see them on the side of a building early in the morning chewing away what are they doing well they're collecting cellulose that they're going to bring to the site that they've chosen for their paper wasp nest and then they're going to build that up and so we start to see these tiny nests this time of year you know golf ball size a little bigger and each one of those is a foundress queen that she starts to build the nest herself. And then as soon as she has cells constructed, hexagonal cells, just like honeybees, she'll lay eggs in there. And then when those female workers hatch out, uh, they start doing the work for her and they also take over foraging duties. So she's building her entire social structure right there. So this time of year, that's very difficult to spot. So when they're out and about and they're foraging, they're no threat, just like honeybees. They're not prone to sting. They're not prone to attack you. The place that they defend and that they will sting is going to be the nest site. So you need to be aware of overhangs on buildings. Uh, evergreen trees are a favorite for them. And by the time people realize that they have a bald-faced hornet nest nearby, or even yellow jacket nests, paper wasp nests, um, they grow pretty large. So how do you know where they are and what's going on? You just need to be vigilant and see what's going on. You need to see where they're flying, especially yellow jackets, not just the bald faced hornets, but the yellow jackets that are black and yellow striped uh, can live in the ground. And sometimes their entrances are very well hidden. That's why a lot of young people find them for the first time when they're mowing the yard or something like that. And they step on the nest or vibrate next to it and they all come out and start stinging and clinging to your legs and things like that. So the first Im impression can be a terrible one. Uh, but the bald faced hornet specifically, as you get into fall, they get bigger. Uh, so the nests can be, you know, basketball sized. And I've dealt with those before for other people when they find them next to their driveway and things like that. So I've made videos about how to collect them. But if you suffer potentially from anaphylactic shock that you can be stung by a bee or a wasp or a hornet, and uh, have a life-threatening reaction to that, then you need somebody else uh, to deal with the nest when you find it. But in springtime, also if you have propane tanks, you know the little metal cap that's on the center of the propane tank, that is a favorite spot for bald-faced hornets, yellow jackets, and paper wasps to start to build, any sheltered location. So this time of year, it's easy to spot them and then just you know scrape them off of there. On the other hand, how do you find out where they're going? So if you've got somebody that could help you out, you can actually feed them. So they all go after nectar 
and you can set out nectar just like for bees and when they come fill up and they fly away you can see what direction they're going so it's just like bee lining when you get honeybees to feed on a honey resource and then they fill up and they're heavy and you watch them fly away in what direction they go same thing for wasps and bald-faced hornets you eventually then you go that direction let them discover the source again and then you keep following them until you see where their nest is i don't think they're a huge threat so as long as you're aware of where they hide and what they do you can put out food resources and see what direction they go to and come from because they're very obvious about it the question about whether or not there are predators that feed on them i don't know of any so they pretty much do what they want i don't even know of any birds that feed on the bald faced hornet <clears throat> which is also called the white-faced hornet, the bull hornet, the bullet hornet. Uh, they earn that reputation. And this gives you some idea of what they look like. That's a bald-faced hornet right there. Very distinctive. <clears throat> Question number four. Emil Andrusco from Yardley, PA. If while doing a hive inspection, you come across both supersedure cells and swarm cells what do you do it's my understanding that swarm cells represent a natural way for the hive to multiply while supersedure cells are created to replace a weak queen interested in your thoughts well uh swarm cells supersedure cells what we're talking about are cells that the bees generally build on the edges the perimeter of their brood frames so when they build those cells, they're large, looks like a planter's peanut shell. Uh, that's to produce a new queen, just as described here, but there are distinctions. So usually if it's in the middle of the field somewhere and that little cell is extended and it droops down, parallel, you know, drawn to gravity, then that is a supersedure cell in general. But if you have both, swarm cells along the edges, supersedure cell out of the middle, uh, it's not anything to worry about except they're swarming for sure so that's when you need to be ready and if the queen is still there in that colony personally what would i do uh, some people go through and say oh just smush all the queen cells and and hold them off now is one better than the other the supersedure cell out of the middle which is developed from a, a general worker cell is not as good in my opinion uh, as those cells that are built from the beginning. So they start as queen cups, and it looks like the top of an acorn. Uh, that little cap that's on the acorn, you'll find those on the perimeter of your frames a lot any time of year, and they're empty. That's a queen cup. And the queen cup means they've got, they've got the foundation. The footers are in, the flat work is in, and they're ready to finish the structure. But they don't need to do that until one day the queen decides to put an egg there. And when that happens, it becomes now, instead of a queen cup, queen cell, and they finish drawing it out. So those have more preparation, a larger space, a better fed queen, and uh, a larger cell. So when you look at queen cells, do, 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 the biggest ones and the ones that have been modeled the most and worked the most have been demonstrated to be preferred by the worker bees, those doing the wax work. And so those are my choice. So they are superior than the smaller queen cells that tend to come out from the face of the frame. So then uh, I would be looking for the queen and I would be trying to collect the queen and uh, create a split right then. They're gonna swarm anyway. You risk losing a bunch of your bees up to 70%. Most often it's about half the workforce. But if you can find the queen and collect her and pull a couple frames of brood and leave the frames with the queen cells on them, the ones with the largest queen cells. So if you have choices, leave the largest queen cells and then you can go about smushing the others. But I also would leave several. That's an insurance policy. But I would remove uh, the queen with brood frames and I would put her in a nucleus hive box. So a five frame deep nuke wooden box, which I've talked about before. Every backyard beekeeper that's not concerned about limiting the number of hives they have should definitely have wooden nucleus five frame deep boxes for incidents just like this. And then once you pull that out, then they won't swarm because they don't swarm without a queen. So if you move the queen with them, you created what's known as an artificial swarm. And now under your control, so you don't have to wait for them to go and bivouac on a tree branch somewhere and hope that you happen to be there that day when you run out and collect them. 
with your vacuum or butterfly net or however you collect swarms. So, and then expand the colony too to give them space as we described earlier today. They need space for expansion because that's one of the triggers. High population, occupying the volume 80% or more, and uh, you have nectar, pollen, and everything showing up in the environment so they have the resources they need. This is prime time for them to take off. So you can do that. <clears throat> but those are my thoughts. The uh, super procedure cells, not as good as uh, standard swarm cells. The fact that they're making both at once, they're just overdoing it. In fact, the fact that they did a super procedure cell, I think they're providing their own insurance policy. I think, unfortunately, the queen may have already left. Because in the absence of a queen, and they start to lose her pheromone, they can panic. And they'll have about three days to do that. Because in three days, all of her eggs will have hatched and turned into larvae. So, it's another issue there. You may not have the queen. So now you're working with what you do have. Next question, number five, comes from Selena Fansler, Newville, PA. I have a question about the long Langstroth hive. I'm not able to lift the standard hives anymore, so my brother built me some long Langstroth hives. My question is, what is the best way to arrange the frames in the hive when I move them? They are currently in double deeps. So if we have double deeps, and if those are 10 frames, then we have 20 frames coming out of two double deeps. There are two deeps, double deeps. Also, if I indicate uh, the hive, if I locate the hive right where the old hive is, will they have any issues finding it at the end of the day when everyone is inside? Thoughts. Okay. Uh, no, as long as the hive that you're replacing the existing hives with has the entrance in roughly the same spot, height, position as the old one, they're going to find it pretty quick. Uh, the other thing is when we're migrating from deep boxes into a horizontal Langstroth hive, which is generally all deep frames, there are some configurations that have shallow frames out at the end. That's not what I prefer, but if you have all deep frames and you have a single entrance, then the first couple of frames by the entrance, the entrance should be at one end or the other, hopefully not in the center. So if your entrance is at one end, that's where you start a couple of drawn frames. And then you start with your brood right there. And I start with the full frames of brood and continue with the full frames until you get the half full frames, third full and so on. So start the brood and taper off the brood going away from the entrance. And then it's all your nectar, capped honey and all those resources are the farthest from the entrance because that is what the bees have shown us that they do when they occupy a space on their own. So a couple of frames first as spacers from the entrance but then start again with your full brood frames and then the smaller amounts of brood going out from that because that's what you would find if they had done it on their own. So that's a pretty easy one. Question number six. Philip Davis, Sevierville, Tennessee. Nice town, been there. I've installed a new package of Italian bees on Monday, today, Friday. I checked to make sure the queen had been released and sure enough, the queen cage was empty. However, no sign of the queen inside the brood. No sign of the queen inside the brood. That said, two frames had been completely drawn out and several others had been started, but they were all full of nectar, no eggs. I could not locate the queen. Any suggestions on what may be happening and why are the bees filling up the frames only with nectar? Is the queen missing or possibly dead? Well, there's some things going on here. <clears throat> First of all, install the package on Monday. The queen was out of her cage by Wednesday or Thursday, maybe. Don't know for sure, but you inspect her Friday and the cage was empty. So they ate the candy plug out and the queen got out. So she's in there. And she may not be laying immediately, but there are some positive signs going on here. One is honeybees that are queenless tend to not spend time building infrastructure. So the fact that they're building new comb, that they're being productive, that they're expanding resources, tells me that somewhere in there, there's a queen pheromone present. And sometimes this rarely happens, but sometimes the queen that came with the package, she might not be fertile. She may not have been adequately mated. She may still be planning to do a mating flight. We don't know, but you're gonna have your answers. Of course, this is last Friday. So if uh, Philip will chime in and update us uh, in the comment section below this video, 
It would be great to know kind of what you found out, but I highly suspect the queen is still there and that they're building infrastructure because they're satisfied that there's a queen pheromone present. And uh, I think she probably started laying later. So the environment too, I don't know what's going on, but that uh, down in Tennessee, things should be really cooking up. So there's probably lots of pollen and resources there. The other thing I would do is be watching the landing board to see if pollen's coming in at all. If you get pollen coming in within the first couple of weeks of installing a package, there's a queen in there because they don't do that unless you're going to rear brood. So those are things to watch for and things that I hopefully um, Philip will update us on. But I think it sounds to me like he got something in there still. So I ho hopefully the package didn't go through any abuse on its way there. Question number seven is next. Michelle Armstrong from Detroit, Michigan, Motor City. So I would like to move one of my hives, three mediums, so three medium boxes, from the shade to more sun, 20 feet away. I can only lift one box at a time and can't con my children into helping me with this effort. Kids today, you know what I mean? Anyway, <clears throat> can I move the hive to the new location in one move? Or must I do it incrementally three feet at a time? Regardless of the method, I think I'm supposed to put branches in front of the entrance to force reorientation. Any thoughts? Okay, so here's the thing. And this is a piece of equipment, by the way, that I'm about to recommend. Every backyard beekeeper needs one. Or even more than one. I have more than one. What do you think I'm going to talk about? First of all, here are the options. Three feet is too much movement. So... We need to move it in increments and uh, we don't want to disturb the bees each time. You can't lift three boxes. So these are three mediums and the hive needs to be moved. If it needs to be moved in increments and you can only lift one box at a time, you would ultimately be pulling apart each box every day for several days. That's a problem and that could force your bees to abscond because bees don't like to be invaded frequently, especially this time of year. So what are the options? Number one, which is not really an option for you there, uh, but it could be to take the entire hive away for several weeks to another location and then bring it all the way back. Now, is that convenient? Is that good? Not convenient for me. I don't like it. I don't want to do that. So then if we're going to move it in increments and we don't want to lift the boxes every day, what are the options? So I don't know if you've been to the garden center, but you see the wagons that they pull around at the garden center. And some of these wagons have flat beds on them, like expanded metal flat beds. And they have sides that flip up, metal sides. So you can flip them down, and then they're nice and level straight across. So they're garden carts. That's what I have, the metal ones. And this means that you can put the sides down, move your hive onto that cart. And I think you know what I'm about to say. Put them on your garden cart, have it all oriented the way you want it to be, and then roll that garden cart two feet every single night until it's ultimately where you need it to be. All the boxes will stay together. You don't have to lift anything until you get it to its final destination and then you transfer them for that last two foot move right onto the hive stand where they're going to be. So these garden carts, like I did this really fundamental illustration. There's your garden cart with your beehives on it and you can even strap them to the garden cart. The sides flip down. I'll put a link for those who don't know what I'm talking about. But uh, super handy. And I have the, I forget what they're called, gorilla carts or something like that. But those are deep and not great for this kind of thing. Because uh, the beauty of these garden center carts is the fact that it's a flatbed with no lip or railing to move it over if you don't want it. So they flip up, flip down, they're also removable. Uh, so it allows you to strap your hive to that. I think it's a great thing to have. Uh, and you can even pull them behind your your golf cart or your lawnmower, your tractor, whatever you have, and you can daisy chain them so you can have several carts together. Lots of fun for your grandkids. Just letting you know, but that's what I would do. I'd get a garden cart, put it on the cart every night, move it two feet, not three feet, two feet, because they're still going to be confused every morning. Uh, but that'll work. Question number eight, Nathaniel Satterley, Fort Scott, Kansas. After a very frustrating package install, the bees seem to have finally settled in the hive. I see them working. The entrance is quite busy, but I don't see any pollen coming in. I'm not looking for a super detailed answer as much as peace of mind. They have only been installed for a couple of days. 
Okay, and this is going to be very common this time of year because a lot of brand new beekeepers are getting their packages for the first time. You get your package, you install them, the queen gets out of her cage, you remove that queen cage. Don't forget to do that. Another very common mistake that people make when they install their first package is they forget the queen cage is in there and they don't push the frames back together. Then they get this stray comb and they have a problem. So by the third day, get that queen cage out of there. If the queen is still in it, you'll see that there's a candy side right here. And then you'll see that there's an open side over here with a cork. Pull this cork out, release that queen if by the third day she has not been released by the bees through the candy plug. Once she's out, now you have to be patient because they work on infrastructure. Now it doesn't say here some things that I would ask. Do you have drawn comb? If you don't, that's their first order of business. And that's also why when you install a package, you need one-to-one -one sugar syrup on it 24-7. That's because it gives them nutrients and resources for carbohydrates so they have the energy to do what they need to do. And it gives them the resource that they need to build the new comb. Because you could have rainy days, you could have cold nights, you could have a lot of problems that could slow that productivity down. They're not going to bring in pollen and they're not going to bring in nectar and they're not going to start to produce new bees until the infrastructure is there to support it. Now it is funny sometimes once the combs, I've seen combs under construction that are very close to the foundation. So you'll just see the white edges. Avoid the tendency to want to get in there and look at them all the time. So your observations should be made at this point of the landing board or the entrance only. Don't be opening it up to see what's going on. That annoys the bees. Hopefully your hive is sized right for the package install. So when you install your first package of bees, you should have only one box, a brood box. You shouldn't have supers on, you shouldn't have multi-levels yet, a single box. If you have drawn comb and your best foundation, heavy waxed, that should be in there. If you have no drawn comb, one of your really fast startup options would be Better Comb. Better Comb looks like this. Synthetic pre-drawn cells ready to go. The bees can work them right away and it saves them a lot of work. But packages generally can build up fast if you provide the resources that they have. But Better Comb does kick them off. Uh, so then what you should see by the end of the first week, unless weather's been terrible and unless your environment doesn't provide it, you should see pollen coming in. Now, when you see any pollen coming in after there's been a package install, by the end of the first week, you'll see little bits of it coming. Remember, your bees are also orienting to that environment and they're finding out where the resources are. So they're new to the neighborhood. They have to cruise around and explore. That's what scout bees are all about. They find resources, they come back, they hit the dance floor, they do their waggle dance, they show whether it's a nectar resource or a pollen resource, they get approval from the nurse bees, and other scouts head out and then foragers follow. And then they start picking up their numbers and bringing in that resource. So the resources have to be in the environment. And then when they start to do that, if you see 10 or more pollen foragers coming in through that entrance or landing board, and when this activity would be at its peak would be about two in the afternoon to three in the afternoon. Not a lot of activity in the morning unless it's really dry where you are, but bees like to avoid pollen and nectar early in the morning when there's a heavy dew, for example, because that reduces the nutrient value. And a lot of plants, a lot of flowers hide their pollen when it's damp. So even dandelions, you'll notice, close up at night, open with the new day. Close up at night, open with the new day. So bees know that the sugar content of the nectar that they're going to get is increased later in the day. Because the sugar content of the, necro, the nectar, the sucrose that they're getting from the nectaries of those flowers, changes throughout the day, even from the same flower. So it might be a higher water content early in the morning, where later in the day, it's a higher sugar content, less water. So bees are smart. So anyway, I would love to hear from Nathaniel what you're seeing now down in the comment section below, please and tell us, but uh, you are just worrying too much, but that's common for brand new beekeepers. And once the queen is out of her cage, please do not open your hive and do frequent inspections. How often can you look into your hive or should you look into your hive when you have a brand new colony like that? About once every 14 days is more than enough. So, because what are you gonna do? <clears throat> Other than verify that you have a laying queen. Find out what you need to know, get out of there. Harass your bees as little as possible. Make as many observations as you can on the landing board. So that's question number eight. Moving on to question number nine. 
Eric Anderson, Summersworth, New Hampshire. So our first attempt with a package, starting off very well. See, everybody's putting in packages right now, so this is a timely video, I think. The girls drew out two deeps of comb and stored 65 pounds of honey. Okay, then a bear mauled the hive in late August. So we're talking about last year. The queen was killed, or she left. Installed a new queen, but they didn't have enough numbers to get through the winter and died out. So a new season. I have a nuke arriving soon. Should I feed the honey I have stored back to this nuke colony and give them a head start? Or harvest it, add the honeycomb back, and for them to clean and use. Hive is now securely stabilized and ratchet strapped together. Uh, I almost made it through all of today without coughing. Well, one stop isn't that bad. So anyway, <clears throat> should I harvest? I would harvest the existing honeycomb, by the way. I'd harvest the honey, uncap the comb, and you can let the bees clean it back up and put it in. We already know why they died. They died because a bear attacked them and everything. And then we had a late season start. So we're pretty confident there wasn't disease in the hive that caused the problem. Bees tend to not use capped honey in spring. They tend to use newly brought in resources. So new nectar, sugar syrup, things like that. That's what they'll use first. And they would generally leave the, un leave the capped honey alone anyway. So I would uncap it, harvest it, use it for people. And then uh, put it back in, let them clean it up. And of course, they'll go right into using that again. And uh, good luck with that. Yeah, and that's true. A lot of people that have surplus honey in the wintertime, uh, they leave it on for the bees to, to use as a resource getting through winter. But then when spring arrives, uh, I recommend to all of you, uh, honey that's left over from last year, now that spring is here and you know the colony's made it and they're building up, go ahead and pull off last year's uh, capped honey unless it's crystallized in the cells. So if you poke it with your, your comb or your scratcher, uh, your uncapping comb and things like that, your forks, um, go ahead and find out if it's still liquid in there. If it is, I would extract it and then do exactly as described here. Put it back in, let the bees clean out the cells. You've got honey in spring. You didn't starve them out in winter and they get to fill it with fresh nectar this year. So that's much better, I think, than leaving that on. Question number 10, Johnny Blaylock. Fort Walton Beach, Florida. I have a swarm trap that was being scouted by a large number of bees. I thought for sure it was about to catch a swarm. But they decided to go somewhere else. Now I have about 150 bees living in the swarm trap. They're building comb on the foundation and storing honey. But they do not have a queen. Do you think if I added a frame of brood, larvae, and eggs, they raise a queen? Okay, here's the thing. And this is a great theory uh, question here. What keeps those bees together? What keeps those bees together is a queen pheromone. So I did these studies 10, 12 years ago, uh, 13 years ago, when I needed to document swarm behavior. And one of the things that we really learned <clears throat> is that now this is a small cluster of bees. And sometimes, you know, I've been called to collect a swarm before and people are all excited and animated. We have this huge swarm of bees in our yard and you get there and there's a little tree bench hanging and there's a cluster of bees the size of your fist. And then so somebody might look at that and go, wow, that doesn't make any sense. This should be like a six pound cluster of bees. But you know what generally is in the middle of that cluster? An unmated queen honeybee. She's tiny, her pheromone is weak, her number of followers that go with her is small. But one thing I noticed is you remove that little queen, even though she's not made it and her pheromones weak. If you take her away and put her in a little queen cage, like the little plastic ones that I highly recommend every beekeeper have these handy. And then uh, you collect that queen and you put her in here and you stick a bunch of grass in this hole and you control her and then you can put her where she can breathe and where she's not in sunlight. And then watch that tiny cluster of bees become disoriented. And then they start getting animated, looking all over the place. Where's the queen? Where's the queen? Where's the pheromone? It's missing. And then guess what they do? They disappear. So I'm highly suspicious of what's being described here down in Fort Walton Beach, Florida. 
about 150 bees in a swarm trap and they're building infrastructure. Remember what I said earlier, bees in the absence of a queen don't invest in where they're living. So they're building in infrastructure. They're bringing in resources. So somebody's got a pheromone that's telling them that this is a place that they can live. I would very carefully inspect this tiny cluster of bees to see if they don't already have a queen. By the way, 150 bees, if that's an accurate number, they have like zero chance of survival. Uh, and that's because bees are eusocial and they need to be able to multitask. In other words, somebody needs to be feeding the queen, somebody needs to be feeding the nurse bees, someone needs to be doing house cleaning duties, somebody needs to be wax constructing like these are doing here. We need foragers to go out. And not only that, 150 bees, the average beehive loses five to 600 bees every day foraging and just through natural attrition. I highly suspect there's a tiny queen in there. Now the other thing is, uh, because do you think I should add a frame of brood, larvae, and eggs? 150 bees can't even cover that frame. So they couldn't keep them warm, they couldn't take care of them. Now if the brood is at the point where it's capped brood and it's about to hatch out, then you could do that because now they're replenishing their workforce right away. So there's a chance that that would work. And what size space should you put them in? A five frame nucleus box. They have like no ability to keep the brood warm, to protect, to water, feed, take care of, do all the jobs they're supposed to do. They're prone to robbing and everything else. That's what I would do. So that's it. I suspect there's a tiny unmated virgin queen in there whose chances are very low. I think that whole little colony with 150 bees is doomed. Minimum 5,000 bees to handle everything. So let us know what happens with them. Again, lots of stories today that we want to get follow-ups on. So that was question number 10. Now we're in the fluff section. And uh, so I want to thank you for being here with me today. There might be some interesting stuff coming up at the end of this video. So keep watching. Anyway, uh, I got this message comment on one of my videos from DC. Hey Fred, I found a small family beekeeping channel for you to look at. Fuzzy Nuggets Apiary, Karen Teague. It's a mom and her kids. I just found the channel, but I think it's the kind of little channel you are looking for for your shout outs. Hope you're feeling better soon. And so here's the thing. <clears throat> I looked up uh, Fuzzy Nuggets. Fuzzy Nuggets Apiary, Karen Teague. I'm going to put a link down in the video description below. And I uh, looked them up. They have eight views on their recent video. 17 subscribers. So, and it's actually a really cool channel. And they're doing a lot of work. So, obviously a mother who is homeschooling her kids. And a big part of that, what better way to, on a practical level, teach your kids about biology then have beehives in your own backyard apiary and your own kids working the beehives. It's a cool channel. I hope you're gonna check it out. Another thing that's conspicuous, they uh, custom painted each of their beehives. So there's like the dandelion hive, there's the daisy hive and so on. And uh, the hives, she built the hives. So they're not, one of the first things you're gonna notice if you look at this video, and I hope you will. Um, they're not standard beehives. Everything looks custom. So somebody there has great skills. Full disclosure, this is pretty funny that this was recommended to me because I met them at the Hive Life Conference down in Sevierville, Tennessee. So I know who they are and it's happy, uh, I'm very happy to go ahead and give a shout out to them. Invite you to go and check it out. Follow the link below. Give them some encouragement, thumbs up, subscribe, things like that. Uh, Really cool to see little kids receiving an education like that. And another thing I like to see when someone's teaching kids about uh, bees or anything, any farmstead activity, letting the kids go hands-on with everything. Um, a lot of parents like to just dictate everything and give detailed guidance step by step. Do this, do that. Don't touch this. Don't touch that. What I like to see and what has been proven to be really beneficial for the development of kids and their self-confidence and all that stuff is to give them a task and then see how they want to accomplish the task on their own. 
Uh, obviously, if they're about to do it wrong, and if it's going to cause detriment to some animal or something that you're doing, you have to interrupt them. But if it's just not efficient, let the kids kind of work it out. And you'll be amazed at how keen they become at problem solving when you're not what's known as a snowplow parent. Snowplow parents move all obstacles out of the way and tell the kids exactly how to do everything. So it's a lot of fun uh, to have something like, and to find kids that are interested in bees, that are unafraid of bees, check that channel out. So the other thing is, one of the biggest and most frequent questions I get this time of year is, we're about to plant flowers for the bees. We're going to plant our field. We're going to plant our lawn. In fact, we're going to stop mowing the yard and we want to go to a no-mow lawn that's good for pollinators. So you're going to get this answer from people all over the country. Well, this depends on where you live. This depends on what's growing where you and what works in your ag zone and what hardiness zone and everything else. So not one thing that works in the desert southwest isn't going to work in Maine or New Hampshire or Vermont. So the book that I held up in the thumbnail is what we're talking about today. And this is published by the Xerxes Society. And it's Attracting Native Pollinators, Protecting North America's Bees and Butterflies. So something that you should know, <clears throat> because when you're a beekeeper, people ask you questions about bees and hornets and wasps. They just assume you just know all about it. And there are a lot of people that say, I took up beekeeping because I really wanted to help pollinators. And that's true. Native pollinators are different from the honeybees that we keep because the honeybees that we keep are non-native. They were brought in. So, and then you'll hear people say that, well, your bees are competing with our native pollinators. And then they, they can start to get up in your grill a little bit and start uh, harassing you with that. Like you put those honeybees there, they don't belong here. This is for, you know, the blue orchard bees, the bobs and things like that, the bumblebees, the, the emerald green bees and things like that. So, but what really happens is beekeepers become more and more in tune to the environment that they're working their bees in. And that's because suddenly they're aware that what's going on in this environment has a direct impact on the success of keeping their own bees. And they're going to see their bees do well, and they're going to see their bees not do so well. And then the problem solving kicks in. Why don't they get pollen yet? How come 20 miles away, their bees are bringing in pollen and mine aren't yet? So you start to become aware, hopefully, of what's going on in your environment. And hopefully you'll take nature hikes. And you'll look around this time of year, for example, where we are. Where are the bees getting all this pollen? Look at all the different colors. What's going on? Which is really good. The more that it represents a buffet of a lot of different resources, then we know that they're not depending on one protein source to raise their baby bees. So this book, I just wanted to open to a couple of pages that are relevant to me. So the things that I like here, for example, swamp milkweed. So there are things that I look for. <clears throat> so rather than always tell people what I'm planting, how I'm doing it, because that's the other thing. What do you plant? How do you plant it? How much work is that? And is it gonna benefit the bees? Well, the thing is, bees like to go where the resources they need are the most abundant. If you find that your entire field is covered in dandelions and the dandelions are in bloom and you don't see very many bees on them, good news. That's because your bees found something better. See, dandelions are like the ditch effort, the backup plan. So that's where the pollen and nectar is if they can't find anything else. But if the trees are blooming and blossoming and there's lots of stuff being produced there, the bees are going to demonstrate a preference for early fruiting trees and things like that. So get this book from the Xerxes Society and you'll find out the specifics of each plant. I'm a fan of perennials. So there are annuals like the Cosmos, which I planted last year for the first time. Cosmos, fantastic. Fantastic. Late season nectar and pollen source. Also, uh, for spring, so right this time of year, we look for the dandelions. I don't have anything that I've planted that comes up yet this early. So what can you plant that will give you a broad range of provisioning your bees? Uh, there are lots of white clover. And when you put white clover out there, it's a perennial, so it spreads all over the place. And there are people that go to great length to kill off clover from their lawns. Makes perfect sense to me, right? 
Kill clover, kill dandelions, put chemicals out there, and make sure that your lawn is green and a starvation point for any insect. And I mean that in the most cynical possible way. So every spring, I get on my soapbox through social media, and I try to convince people to grow flowering plants in their lawn. And in place of your lawn, it would be perfect. So uh, clover's going to come in. And the other thing that I plant, sunflowers. I plant acres of sunflowers. Some sunflowers are annuals. Some are uh, perennial. So like the Maximilian sunflowers, late season perennial. They grow really tall. Some people don't want them. I love them. They're fantastic. If you're a photographer or something, they're the perfect backdrop because they're taller than people. And you stand people in front of them and you take their pictures. And Cosmos, same thing. Five feet they can grow. And there's a bunch of different varieties of it. So finding out what kind of nectar supply they have, um, you probably need a book like the one I mentioned. So I'll put a link down to that because I do support the Xerxes Society, by the way. And uh, I think it's very useful for you to understand, uh, for example, not all sunflowers are the same. In fact, when you're shopping for sunflowers, you're going to find out often that there are pollen-free varieties of sunflowers. You don't want those because the pollen that comes from the sunflowers is going to benefit your bees. Some of it has proven to be effective against Nozema, some of it has proven to be effective against um, even fowl brood because it's fed to the brood. So there's a lot of work being done, a lot of new stuff going on there. So I hope you'll consider that book. And because I plant acres, I don't fiddle with it. So what I do is I mow it down with my tractor and then I till it and I till it in two directions. So about six inches deep. And then this is for cosmos, hyssop, uh, the sunflowers, everything that I plant. It's a very casual, non-heavy work kind of way. So I mow it down, I till it, I go out there, I hand broadcast everything. I think my wife is angry when she goes out and throws it because she throws seeds in clumps. They grow up later. She's not good at spreading things evenly. So give it to people that, that want to spread the flowers out well. And then I come in with a 700 pound roller and those are just the rollers that you fill with water and uh, pull that behind the tractor and I run it two directions over it and make that to press the soil down and get the soil contact and then I just leave it and every year it has grown fantastic acres of it. So this year um, I buy my seed by the pound so it can seem very expensive. Uh, so if you spent 60 or 80 dollars on uh, a few pounds, five pounds of seed. Uh, but then what are you going to get out of that? So first of all, you get healthier bees and pollinator, pollinators of all kinds come to it. Birds, bees, everything else. There are birds that are going to eat the seeds in fall and they spread them around. That's the other thing about the cosmos. Uh, the birds, goldfinches and things like that eat them. And grass sparrows, I don't know what they're doing. But uh, they must be spreading the seeds around. So I'll be interested to see this year if the cosmos, which are considered annual plants, if there's enough seed that they spread around that it will kind of come back as a volunteer along forest edges and ditches and things like that. So that'll be interested. So those are the things that I plant myself. <clears throat> so the clover I plant, the sunflowers we plant, hyssop, anise, hyssop. And uh, of course... Maximilians and Cosmos. That's it. Everything else is just a matter of letting wild areas grow. So it's amazing. Joe pie weed, milkweeds. So the milkweeds, so I take it back. I did also plant milkweeds. And I thought I had failed plots of swamp milkweed because we're impatient. You know, you plant the seeds, you want to see them grow. And uh, then you find out that you didn't really get any of those milkweeds. So what's going on? We see the standard milkweeds. In fact, when we leave those alone, they spread you know, through rhizomes, I guess. And, uh, but the swamp milkweed that I want seemed to not make it. But then a year later, all of a sudden it's popping up around the place. So, hey, it took off. So be patient. Also, the anise hyssop. I thought I would have these huge stands of three foot tall hyssop everywhere and my bees will be all over it. And uh, so the first year, you know, we found little six inch tall plants and everything. But then the second year and the third year, now they're a couple feet tall and they're, again, perennial, which means once they're established, just let them go. 
So think in the long term when you're planting for your bees. And uh, if you don't have property of your own, then it's time to start uh, bending the ear of your friends and neighbors who do have property and see if we can't get them to grow things that are beneficial to all pollinators, not just your bees. So then there's one more thing we need to talk about. There's a great source of information. Uh, you might hear people say things like, uh, are you following the best practices in beekeeping? And where do they come up with what the best practices are? What are the standards of beekeeping that guarantee your success or at least put you on the leading edge of doing successful things with your hives? Well, it's through a citizen science program and it's called the Bee Informed Partnership. And I hope you write that down. I hope you'll Google it and find their website, the Bee Informed Partnership. They've been going on for about 10 years. And what they do is they get feedback from commercial beekeepers all the way down to backyard beekeepers. Survival rates through the winter time. So it starts to get a very focused picture all over the country about where bees are doing well, where they're not. And then of course, the reasoning behind why they did well or didn't. Because there are a lot of other bits of information provided by beekeepers all over the country. Did you treat? Do you not treat? Are your hives insulated? Are they not insulated? Do you feed them? Do you not feed? And things like that. So when you go to the Bee Informed Partnership, if you've never taken the survey, we're still in the time frame now when they're doing the survey. So it's very important. The more people that contribute their information to the survey, the better understanding we'll have about what works for honeybees in what part of the country. So I highly encourage everyone out there in the United States at least <clears throat> to take part in the Bee Informed Partnership Survey. I'm going to put a link to that down below and I hope that you'll contribute. And for those of you who have never heard of it, go to the website and it is a wealth of information because you can find out what has worked the most. So we're, it's compiling statistics about what your chances are by best practices, uh, how you manage your bees, and you'll find out that there may be some things that you could be doing that you never even thought of. So what works most frequently where you live? So that's it for today. I want to thank you for watching and for spending your time with me here, and I hope that you have a fantastic weekend. Thanks for being here today.